Now, recently, when I was chatting with someone about um, New Iron Sides because they wanted to borrow some of my notes, they're a lecturer in America, and they were sort of asking this, asked me, how do you get students to be quiet when you're starting talking? I didn't have the heart to tell them that more often than not, uh, most of my students go quiet when I start talking. It's rare. I have issues. I'm known for being sarcastic when I need to be. No one will steal that level of sarcasm. Not all the time of days I teach. But I do have one phraseology I use. Right then, students. It's well known I run on ships and giggles. I'm all out of giggles, so it's time to talk ships, so take your seats. It tends to work. It tends to start some giggles to begin with, but it tends to work. Anyway, this is New Ironsides, which was episode 8 of series 1 of Key Ships. And that feels like a long time ago. 21st of April, 2023. And this was a fun one for me to do. It really was a fun one for me to do. Now I'm going to... I have to admit, I have changed my normal style of doing these, video, uh, these discussions and questions. Mainly because... If I want to have that, the uh, lovely slides up above the comments, I need to deal with the top one first. I usually start from the bottom, work my way up. I have to work from the top and work my way down. So I apologize. Change the order on you. But I like it this way because you can see the comments. Red Hand 1949. Thank you for talking about this good, uh, but sadly in the neglected warship in the history books. She's one of my favourite ships from the American Civil War. She's a very cool ship, and she's a very neglected ship. You can say that many times over and twice on Sundays. I will never disagree. Um, Strider. Hello. Hey Doc, just wondering, how well is a monitor built compared to Warrior? As someone who knows less than the one who would ask the, que- uh, ask the fermented question, about who would win. I'm not well enough yet in Naval History to know such answers. Okay, so the monitor is well built for a war emergency build, but has issues. As all war emergency builds tend to do, because speed is a criteria, and as any builder, contractor, anyone will tell you, you can have it one of three ways. You can have it cheap, you can have it fast, or you can have it done well. You can have any of those two options, but you can't ever have all three. In war emergency builds, they tend to try for all three and fail. It's rarely is it cheap, and often it's not done well, but it's always for done fast. Matthew Keeling, uh, 886. Unfortunately, US Navy didn't build a successor design. Perhaps something somewhat longer of a more uh, of a seagoing hollow shape. 20 to 24 guns, plus some Gatling guns to deal with any Yahoos with spar torpedoes before they hurt themselves, and a higher top speed. With a good four to six ships built, such a design could have given the US the core of a decent force for both deep water coast protection and gunboat diplomacy in Central South America, and a sea force for later naval expansions. Such was absolutely within the country's industrial capability at the time. Congress's ability to comprehend the need of such force is a different matter entirely. Yes, this is all pre Mahan getting successful. It's pre America building up its self identity to be world spanning. Sorry, Corky Glitter gets everywhere. It's pre America. I would say America is always, it's such a large place, and it's people quite so vast, that it's very easy for it to feel like a world in and of itself, and therefore why do you need to go further? 
And the thing is, America is also very interconnected. It's one of those interesting questions when you talked about America and people talk about onshoring, etc. There is a lot you can do in that regard, but you're still going to need some things. And the problem for America is that by virtue of their size, if they get involved, they're all automatically expected to do certain things and be at a certain level. And if they're not, they look weaker than they actually are. That's a problem for them for several decades in this period. They often look weaker than they actually are because due to their size, if they're expected to turn up with X, Y, and Z, and they turn up with G. It just doesn't really work. New Ironside. Don't you right? New Ironside was very similar to the floating batteries built from the, uh, for the Crimean War by the British and French for the same mission. HS Warrior would have outmatched New Ironsides, but I wonder how the French Glar would have matched up one on one. Glar had 36 guns, but with a wooden hull like New Ironsides. That would be a very interesting fight. That would be a very interesting fight. New Ironsides versus Gloire. I didn't really think about that much at the time, but... I'd say Ironsides is better sailing characteristics than Gloire. Certainly the better rigging characteristics, I would argue. Ooh. She could pull it off quite as she could pull it off. It wouldn't be an easy fight. Dave McIntyre, more interesting would be a battle between Cerberus and a large monitor in a coastal seaway. It wouldn't really be interesting. They just spent hours pounding at each other and nothing would happen. Eric D. Kaufman, hello. It's my understanding, having grown up spending summers in Charleston, that the two torpedo boats are under... Trad Street, beside the Coast Guard Station, the Ashley River, at the start of the battery on the side of, on that side of town. I will bow to your superior local knowledge. I will also say, cool. Wonder if I could find a way to look at them. Bijan, it's a shame the U.S. Navy didn't um, did not rebuild New Ironsides after she burnt and sank. I assume. Her armor could have been salvaged and refurbished. I would have gone with a 20 foot draft up from 16 foot of the original so that she could have a more S shaped hull as opposed to the flat bottom of the original, which made her difficult to steer. Still surprisingly better and more flexible than the Gloire, but we'll leave it on one side. I would have given her an, uh, an nicely angled ram bow, I'm presuming, rather than a nickel and angled ram bow. And last, I would have rebuilt her with a composite hull, iron framing with wooden planking. So she can have a copper bottom and be easier to build with a labour unskilled at bending iron plow planting. I think rebuilt as such, she would have served the US Navy well into the 1890s. The iron upgraded to 6 inch breech loading guns. Hmm. Sounds like good options to me. Ball from Chicago, why can no Brits say Galena correctly? Correctly according to whom? The people from Galena? Probably. But. Galena is a historical word of phraseology. Mm -hmm. uh, Captain Nemo, 1587. Most, if not all, the ironclads you just made us all are forgotten except for Monitor. Oh, they are. And there were a lot of them. And some of them are absolutely gorgeous. Some of them are really interesting designs. That's why a couple of them have showed up in key ships and more will be coming along. Okay. Brandon, you've done a long one, and I'm trying to make sure we have everything in the one picture I doubt we're going to are we we're not going to unless I get rid of the new iron side slides up which I'm supposed to be playing so Brandon Burns first I want to thank you for the quality presentation you produce on a astonishing regular basis oh that's very kind of you the fact you're saying quality on a regular basis means that the, I'm managing to con provide consistency at certain points there are times I do wonder about it because I do go off on tangents occasionally I mean, it's the fact I still very much enjoy doing these videos, which means they're always fun for me, which means I can, I do sometimes treat it slightly less serious than work, where 
even though I shouldn't, probably, in that I will wander off. Um, whereas at work, I, of course, I've got a limited amount of time, and I'm having to hit the points for the students on the course and keeping the module. Within parameters, I do add in the odd, odd useful. Well, we could say historical story, but gob it is the phrase which is really loved in one of the departments I do some work with. Um, but the thing is, on the videos, I often go, well, if that story's going to add an extra three minutes to the video, I don't mind. I don't think most of my viewers will mind, they might enjoy it, so I'll add it. I think the trick is to consider the USS New United States in the same thought, albeit rather counterfactually, in conjunction with the USS Puritan and the USS Dictator, as well as the USS Dunderberg and USS Juan Panog. The ships operating unlimited along the eastern seaboard of the United States would have been preeminent action force able to overcome both of the HMS Warrior Class Ironclads, but on a ship by ship, ship on ship, a one to one basis, the warrior reigns supreme for a surprising amount of time. Is she well equipped HMS? There are not. I think the problem with that one is that by the time enough of those came available, you should see what the Royal Navy would have brought up in that squadron with with Warrior. Because if they know Warrior and Black Prince are going to face that level of squadron, well, A, they're, they're building next generation already behind Warrior and Black Prince and of ironclad frigates, so they could have an entire matching squadron of those. But B, they've got a surprisingly large number of steam powered ships of the line which serve around for quite a while which are quite big which would have come along behind warrior I think it whatever happens it would have been an interesting scenario it would have been a really interesting scenario because those navies are very similar in some of their ethos even when they're trying not to be they sometimes approach the same thought process from completely different starting points and by completely different methodologies and then you listen to her thinking going okay if we all look at the thesaurus here you will realize you two are arguing very aggressively the exact same thing can we please just stop arguing it, agree, and move on. No, we're going to continue arguing over wording. Okay, that's it. No pudding. Off to bed. It didn't work. Dang. It's uh, worked on my little cousins. Anyway, on the inverse situation, as portrayed in Conroy's 1862, the new Ironsides keeps the warrior busy, no critical damage on either side. Mm -hmm. While the monitors, double targeted where possible, pound at the unarmored British wooden ships, getting at the convoy personnel and supply transports. <laughs> new Ironsides is... No, no, that wouldn't keep her busy. I, I, I love the new Ironsides, I think it's very cool and cute, but it would not keep warrior busy. And, um, yeah, there would also be Black Prince there. Even one of them could ram and flood them in the open waters. And if you're in shore work, well, there are all sorts of interesting things that turn up. And as everyone, and then from, that's from Stuart Wald, and then from Brandon Burns, and as everyone always mentions, if Congress ever probably funded both the US Army and US Navy, the United States would have faced a steep but short rise to global power early in the global order. Yes and no. Now, let me explain why yes and no. They could have done. You are right. But there's also the fact that US Congress is sufficiently bullish and full of a sufficiently large enough people who are still descended from the people who started the War of 1812 that with such funding they could have got themselves into serious trouble very quickly. Because there's having building the systems, having the systems in theory, and actually having the systems. Because it's often with infrastructure, it's a case of we've got we've built it. You need to bed in for about ten years to be actually for it to be working and have the processes available. 
but you could rapidly expand everything and then bite off more than you could chew very quickly. It, it's one of those things in history. It happens quite often. It's almost, uh, how to put this, a critical point for rising powers. They start to invest, they get the infrastructure, they get the equipment, and they get use happy. And they wind themselves getting into trouble, which they really didn't need to get into. Gado for one six one. Those smart torpedo carriers, both the submarines, were early pre clear precursors to suicide craft World War Two. Honestly, you're not going to get me argue with me. Spar torpedoes, I, there's, there's no way you would ever get me anywhere near a spar torpedo. No. Just no. Uh, Cup Gunzo. USS Galena was most definitely not a good ship. She is slow. Her gun ports are very large, which is great for hitting targets, but makes a very vulnerable great shot. Galena's armor was so thin that it not only couldn't stop shot, but actually made hits worse by creating extra shrapnel. The Union Navy made her better by stripping off the armor, which made her faster, and a decent unarmed cru unarmored cruiser. I'm not sure I'd call her an unarmored cruiser, but I can see where you're going. I'd prefer to improve her rather than just strip her down to basics and call it that. La Fiel um, Abril. Uh, La Abril. A more even fight might have been New Ironsides versus Virginia, and personally, my bet is squarely on the former. Hmm. I'd agree. I think New Ironsides could win that fight. Got to say, New Ironsides deserves a far kinder fate than the one she was dealt, but fate is rarely kind. Oh, it is rarely very kind at all. So. Oak tree. The Battle of Fort Fisher is an interesting study. A good study on each ship, both good and bad by both sides, amphibious landings, coastal bombs of Fort Sect, and parts of the landward side of the fort are still there near Wilmington as part of the state historic, uh, state historic site. The museum there is small, but quite nice. The seaward sites were reclaimed by the Atlantic Ocean years ago. Ah, oh, ocean. Even less care for history than governments. It's terrible. But glad to hear that some of it has been preserved. Right, and that's added to my list of things I want to visit in the States when I eventually get there or want to go and do some history visiting. Benjamin, can't wait to watch this. I have a whole book on New Ironsides. The Union Navy's only conventional broadside battery ironclad. Mm-hmm. Nathan Brown, 860. Imagine a place where dueling is legal, but only in rooms filled halfway to their ceiling with water. An eight-foot-tall giant challenges a three-foot dwarf to a duel. Who wins? Moreover, chooses the battlefield. That's how I see Monitor and Warrior. Warrior has too much draft to go where Monitor can. Monitor doesn't have the free ball to go where Warrior can. Maybe they were meeting the Mediterranean on a calm day if Monitor was a French or Sicilian ship, but it would never get there from the other America. Vision, very true. Monitors were coastal defense attack ships, not high seas war battleships, which Warrior most certainly was. A point often missed, fear of the British Nelson at Copenhagen attacks on US ports from the war helped fuel the Monitor craze of construction. It's why San Francisco got a Monitor which guarded it till 1900. The Ericsson Monitor design was provided to both Sweden and Russia for coastal defense. Your send monitors were not just for fighting uh, the Confederacy. No, but I would say this. The scenario given was very much a breaking the blockade scenario. So, to an extent, it's monitor uh, in its waters, but warrior coming into it. But the thing is, warrior would be coming into it in estuary areas, where there's usually a fair bit of space maneuvering as well, at the speeds they're going at. As long as if anyone was doing 30-odd knots or something like that, we're talking teens at best so and low teens so there is space for them to maneuver i'd also say that any convoy scenario there's going to be multiple ships there and that's kind of interesting when you consider what others are putting forward as options for british and that's what the british probably would do the british had options they did consider it because well it was a nice theoretically that was concise to do for a few years because there was nothing else interesting for the British to do in the 1860s and 70s at the time it's not as if they were patrolling the world's largest empire and occasionally winding people up in the far east uh, Steve Clark 6257 the Graf Zeppelin is a key ship in that it's not how not to build an aviation ship uh, Blackburn M if you're going to do the never built ship series 
Will this include ships that were converted from their original purpose, like the Lexington class Battlecruisers and Maggie class to and Tossa class? Also, would CVA-01 and the late 1970s nuclear strike cruiser be included as well? I think you'll find pretty much all those are somewhere in the key ship series. I'm not sure about nuclear strike, uh, strike cruiser. I know that's in the American Cruisers series a bit about that, but I don't know if I've done a key ships about that. I might add it into something. See what? Interesting ship, the new, uh, new Ironsides. CSS Almanal uh, be, uh, be a good vessel for a video. She was made to dominate the Almanal sound, since any ship bigger couldn't make it into sound, and smaller CSS Almanal could very much uh, was a very hard nut to contend with by any ship her size. I have a book on the Confederate Navy and the size of the latter built ironclads at the end of war were amazing. The problem was building engines for the rebels. The Union fleet, no problem. Less than 15 years after War of 1812, there were over hundreds of steamships plying the rivers and lakes of the expanding country, so that when it came to railways and locomotives, there was an established technical base. Exactly. Infrastructure. It doesn't matter if it's built by civilians or the government. What you need is to have it. And the North had it in spades in what I it's my free will in what scenario is it a good idea for the carrier to engage another ship with its main guns the answer to this and always has been HMS Football at Mataban being no exception to this never that's what they have escorts for yes you don't want your carrier mucking around having a fight with anyone the CVEs at Laity were sheer desperation while we're at it. Yes. Michael Cooch, 66. Okay, Warrior vs. Monta. I seem to recall Drax said the British had a plan. They'd really uh, realised Monta was slow, low in the water, and had no anti personal weapons. So they planned to spend boarding parties in small boats while the big ship kept Monta occupied. Well, as I put it, there were a couple of plans. And once we've gone through all the, all the comments on this, I will, you know, I will, uh, how do I put this, answer a bit more fully. There are a couple of plans. The one you mentioned, swamping her or just ramming her out of the way. Veteran, Dr. Slot, the issue would be engaging one in the shallow waters of American harbours. Most British and French ironclads would have to uh, have key to keep uh, too deep a draft to manoeuvre or even enter. Look at the problems the CSS Virginia had at Hampton Roads. The British would have had to have sent in gunboats and corvettes and reel not just with the monitor, deal not just with the monitor, but her escorts. The Union Navy knew how new danger of monitors being boarded. Uh, uh, to measure it, uh, to measures to counter that tactic, including having rifle screens on turret stops and even boat houses on the board, houses on board. And then from Lego, a river is a confined space. A couple of bomb vessels could probably deal with it. Two or three mortar bombs going off on her deck would very likely sink her. Now, the the point is the British have multiple plans. Okay, if you have a monitor stupidly brought out to deep enough water. That she that you Black Prince or Warrior or any of the, those ironclad frigates have enough space to do it. They're happy to ram her. They're happy to swamp her. They think they'll make her go down. If they see an opportunity to take her, well, they're the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy's basic motto is: if it isn't tied down, we can procure it. And if it is tied down, how well is it tied down? I mean. How much concrete do you have? How many steel bolts? How deep in the ground does that actually go? Can we use an oxycetylene cutting torch on it? So that's the question. There's always going to be a plan of how to take it. But again, there's a plan that if it was hiding in position and they knew where it was, use bomb vessels. Use the mortar ships. There are lots of options the British have for how to engage it, and they will have would have done it so. That's why it's kind of interesting if you're dealing with a sort of convoy scenario because we're very much not just one ship going in to engage. Interesting as usual. Thank you, David Golding, 366. Right then, I was going to do three of these this evening. I think I'm going to, as it's um, half three, I think I'm going to call it a night then. Thank you very much for watching. Um, hope you enjoy these videos. I, I, I like the key ship series and I like doing the comment response videos because. I've got them coming out six a week for the next roughly eight weeks. So they'll come out Saturday to Thursday in sixes. And then on Friday there will be 
an extra short. Mainly to space them out a bit, but also to give me a bit of time to catch up with them, because the shorts are so much quicker for me to record. Don't take this the wrong way, but a short is 60 seconds. And why am I doing the shorts? Why am I doing all these videos? Well, as you all know, if you've been watching this channel, I work with a group pretty much every year for the last few years dealing with people who have issues at Christmas time in that there are a lot of people who feel very alone at Christmas because not everyone is lucky enough to have family or feel they can go and spend time with family and friends and basically the idea has always been that you provide something to give them something else to look at. It used to be, for me, it started off with me um, publishizing all my articles, making sure they were all getting out on Twitter every single day. I was putting forward a Christmas calendar of articles. And that grew to a Christmas calendar of videos. It's now grown to a roughly eight week period, or rather 58 days, because I added an extra weekend of free videos a day. The idea being that with videos coming out every eight hours, if anyone is bored, if anyone's feeling low, there will always be hopefully some new content to interest them. And one of the reasons why I always put questions at the end of my videos, and I always put questions at the end of my videos, other than some of the common response ones, I honestly don't with some of the common response ones because they don't always need to see and they seem to need them. And because I don't know where the comments are going to go, so I can't really sit there and brainstorm a question for that video, video topic. They have the questions because of two reasons. One, it tells me if people have reached the end of the video, if they've asked the question, answered the question. But two, I have actually received comments back from people that when they were bored, they've watched the video, when they were sort of bored, feeling lonely, and were contemplating other things, let's say. They're watching a video, the question comes up, and going away and researching that question filled in the day. And they picked up another question next day, and another question next day, and then they were back at work. And that helped them. I don't know whether anything would have happened, but the fact it helped them, yeah, I'll keep that up. I'll keep doing it. There's no skin off my nose. I am. I realize how fortunate I am. I realize how lucky I am to have the size of family I do have. The insane size of family I do have. I love them all, but there are lots of them. Not everyone is. And... If you can do something which helps even one person, at no cost, to yourself really other than a little bit of time and a little bit of effort that's worth it that's worth it. that's a no-brainer to me always has been thank you very much for watching hope you enjoyed and take care